whether a person has respiratory failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or other respiratory issues, a ventilator may be needed. A ventilator is a device used to support breathing. It is used when there is difficulty breathing or when spontaneous breathing has stopped. Although there are a number of types of ventilators, the two delivery methods used are called invasive and non-invasive. Join me this week as I discuss the differences between invasive and non-invasive ventilation, pros and cons to each delivery method, and I will share some lessons I have learned along the way. Invasive ventilation involves inserting a breathing tube into the person's airway. The tube can be placed through the person's nose or mouth, or it can be surgically implanted into the patient's neck. Once the breathing tube is in place, the patient is connected to a ventilator. This type of ventilation is called invasive ventilation. Non-invasive ventilation replaces the breathing tube with a tight-fitting mask. Depending on the design of the mask, it may be placed over the patient's nose, the nose and mouth, or the entire face. With the ventilator turned on, positive airway pressure pushes air into the patient's lungs with each breath. CPAP, BiPAP, and mechanical ventilation can be used with either a non-invasive or invasive interface. CPAP and BiPAP ventilation assist with breathing while mechanical ventilators may provide partial or full respiratory support. For more information about ventilators, please see the video, CPAP, BiPAP, and mechanical ventilation essential information. One of the best things about non-invasive ventilation is that the only things needed are a mask and ventilator. The setup is easy. Strap on a mask, turn on the ventilator, and breathe. If a person wants to disconnect from the ventilator, he simply turns off the machine and removes the mask. Non-invasive ventilation requires relatively little care. If a person is hospitalized, the person may be allowed to be placed on a regular hospital floor. If the person needs nursing home care, many nursing homes accept non-invasively ventilated patients. Also, if the patient needs care at home, non-invasive ventilation requires little training. Using non-invasive ventilation does not change the way a person breathes. This means the upper airways are able to provide immune protection from microorganisms. The mask used for non-invasive ventilation can be extremely irritating to the face. The face mask can rub and break down the skin. The skin can also develop a rash and become very tender. Although the non-invasive ventilation masks come in several different sizes, finding the right size may be challenging. Having the wrong size mask will cause the mask to rub. It will also allow air to leak out. This will decrease the effectiveness of the ventilator. When I was on non-invasive ventilation, I cannot tell you how many masks I tried, but all of them caused my face to develop sores. I also could never get the proper fit to my BiPAP mask. Air was constantly leaking out. If the person using non-invasive ventilation needs high pressure to sustain his breathing needs, the high pressure may be hard to tolerate. 
When I was on non-invasive ventilation, my settings were continually increased in an effort to maintain my respiratory needs. The high pressure felt as though I was cruising down the roadway with my head stuck out the car window. It was very unpleasant. Moreover, when I fell asleep, the high-pressured air would cause me to swallow air. This caused my stomach to swell up. When I would wake up in the morning, I would be extremely nauseous. I would sometimes start vomiting up the air from my stomach. In order to eat, drink, and talk, a person needs to remove the non-invasive ventilation mask. If a person on non-invasive ventilation cannot breathe without the ventilator, this means the person will have to choose between breathing and being able to eat, drink, or talk. When I was on non-invasive ventilation, my respiratory failure progressed to such a state that I could not breathe without my BiPAP machine. This meant I was only able to speak a few words before I had to put my mask back on. I often chose not to eat or drink because I did not have the energy to breathe without my BiPAP machine. Invasive ventilation requires a breathing tube. This tube may be inserted through the nose or mouth or it may be surgically implanted into the neck. With invasive ventilation, a person does not have to worry about a mask irritating his face. It is also much easier to sleep when you do not have high pressure blowing in your face all night long. The pressures delivered to the airway via invasive ventilation are more accurate than non-invasive ventilation. With non-invasive ventilation, resistance from the nose, mouth, tongue, and other structures often interfere with the ventilator and prevents the ventilator from delivering the correct pressures to the lungs. With invasive ventilation, if a person needs the ventilator to breathe for him, full respiratory support can be achieved. On the other hand, Non-invasive ventilation requires a person to still be able to breathe on his own. It cannot deliver full respiratory support. One of the biggest drawbacks with invasive ventilation is that it requires either a tube called an endotracheal tube to be placed through the nose or mouth and into the airway, or a tube called a tracheostomy tube to be surgically placed into the neck. Having an indwelling device means there is an increased risk for infection. Additionally, using invasive ventilation means the upper airways are bypassed. The upper airways provide valuable protection against many illnesses. Using invasive ventilation means microorganisms may have direct access to the lower airways and this may lead to an increased rate of infection. Using invasive ventilation requires a higher level of care. In hospitals, a person with invasive ventilation is usually placed in the intensive care unit, step-down intensive care unit, or a special unit such as a stroke unit which has a respiratory therapist present. Additionally, if a person on invasive ventilation needs to go to a nursing home, it may be very difficult to find a facility which will take an invasively ventilated patient. For me, the closest nursing home I have been able to find is about 600 miles from my home. Also, before a person with invasive ventilation is allowed to leave the hospital, a caregiver must be trained on how to manage the ventilator and tracheostomy tube. This training is not technically difficult, but it requires a person to remember a lot of small details. It is not uncommon for the caregiver to feel overwhelmed or inadequate to provide care. 
When getting a tracheostomy tube, a person may lose his ability to speak. A tracheostomy tube will require a person to use different muscles to force air up through the vocal cords. Some people are able to speak quickly, while other people never regain the ability to speak. The decision to get non-invasive or invasive ventilation is one which should be guided by your medical team. The decision should be based on a person's breathing needs and his ability to have the proper care available. Thank you so much for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe down below. I hope you have a great day and a wonderful week. Bye-bye.